Hopefully I'll be able to continue my thought now. I was speaking about how when you're in the zone, there's a unity because there's one attention that doesn't get challenged or questioned. And when you're not in the zone, it doesn't have to be seen. This is the point. It doesn't have to be seen as a negative thing. We're not in the zone, so therefore I, the default position is going to be anxiety. It doesn't have to be. The default position you could fall back on is there's a romance between you and your mission to overcome any inadequacies that you have. It doesn't have to be a bad quality. It could just be something that's not perfect. Said in the negative, it doesn't sound very positive. But think about it. If you're, perf- if you're approaching, if your goal is perfection, that's a pretty challenging feat. That's infinite. To infinitely perfect yourself, to make yourself happy at the core. So whenever you don't, you, whenever you fall out of the zone, out of infl- the inflow state, you are simply in a romance with doing something out of devotion to what we call God. Other people can call a state of their consciousness. When you feel whole and you feel proud of yourself and you feel complete, that's an expression of devotion that you've accomplished that you've accomplished something in your relationship with Hashem or the deepest aspect of yourself if you're if you don't like the word God because to me it's not a question of theism or atheism believing in God or I don't know what atheists believe but it's just a question of what do you really believe even if you if you subscribe to a set of beliefs that are very holy and very not does not be holy and but something that's very worthy and you don't live up to them it's not something you really embrace it's not a real it's a slogan it speaks about how it's superficial but if it's a motto if it's a way of life then it's just who you are shalom israel i'm in the park here in toronto it snowed i don't know if is it close to april yet But look around, it's awesome. So that was one thing I wanted to share this morning. I hope that was clear. If someone, I don't read Spanish, or Judismo probably is in Spanish. (laughs) I wouldn't mind a question in English, though. So that's one thought. If there's a question, I'll stay on this topic. If not, I have another topic this morning. I think I wrote it. Yeah, I did. I wrote it on my page. Yes, yes, yes. Seeing our imperfections as battle scars. <laughs> They're in the past already. A scar you could wear in as some a battle scar you could wear as something that you embraced because you saw yourself going through a challenge that you thought worthy was going to war for. Something that you really care about, something that you're in the zone about. Yes, yeah, so if we see them are imperfections, meaning challenges that we've already overcome, if we see those as battle scars, it automatically causes us to see them as something of the past that we've already climbed beyond. And now we could see that as something we embrace as a treasured effort, an effort that you did for something that you deemed worthy, which I call call God, and a lot of people agree with me about that word, (laughs) but it's the same same point. So that can be seen as battle scars, meaning something that you see as beautiful because you fought for accomplishing something and were willing, willing to risk your comfort for sure but a lot more than that sometimes. And those accomplishments that we have to treasure. 
and, and use it as inspiration, the confidence that we see ourselves as beautiful because our scars, our imperfections, our battle scars, things that you had to work through to stand up in the face of. Now, I know I'm switching topics, but this is related. When people have real imperfections, I've spoken about this before, it's, so, it's an uncomfortable topic. So I'm getting weird things on, on my stream, which I try and unfollow every weird thing that comes on. But sometimes they put things about people who's, whose bodies are not complete. And it makes us, like, I don't know how they get on my screen, but that's what people are promoting. I guess it's, a, an, it's an aesthetic to be able to see. This person doesn't want you to see them as ugly or imperfect. They just want you to accept them for the challenge that they're given. If I... If I, it's hard to even say the words, but you can imagine, I can't say the words, you can imagine a, a person who is suffering, when someone walks in their room and looks down on them like they're nebach, they're, they're a shame. That person doesn't want that. I know we want to do that and that's a natural tendency, but they want you to overcome that feeling and treat them like a normal person which means that you're embracing their battle scars. You're, cha you're seeing it as beautiful, that they were given a challenge, that we should be very grateful that we are not given ourselves, but other people have been given challenges that are what we would think are insurmountable. And they just, wanted, they just want to be treated normally and have somehow have inspire in other people the desire to, to not see them as themselves as ugly because they're seriously not in a complete bodily state. I, I, the reason why, one of the reasons why this topic is relevant is, of course, a friend of mine's brother went through this procedure. You can read about it on my page. But, the, but it does make us feel uncomfortable. So we want to see our own imperfections as battle scars. I think that sums it up. I have another idea I might segue into. Someone's going to divide all these ideas up one day. <laughs> Maybe I'll just leave it as a question. Because I'm running out of time. The sages say that it's irrelevant what task God commands us. It's not really relevant. If God had commanded us to chop wood, examples of wood, <laughs> if that was what we were told to do, if that was our commandment, we would chop wood. And it doesn't make any difference because we're doing what God wants. So my question was, why does it say chop wood? It could have said anything. If God wanted to, us to sit on park benches and play chess, there's a chessboard under the snow somewhere. Check it out. <laughs> you see that? Oh. So if God wanted us to chop wood, we chop wood. Why wood? We could make useful things out of wood, right? Houses too. Those are wooden structures. If you've ever had the merit and to uh, build your own house, you'd see what a, what a house is made out of. It's made out of wood. So why the, the, the sages say we would chop wood? So wood has utility. It could be used for something, wood. It's, it, we don't even relate to wood anymore. <laughs> but in the olden days, if you're living here, Right? In the, in the Arctic, wood is everything to you. It's like water in the desert. We don't appreciate that. But, but, but the terrorist speaks about things that you're supposed to be, identify with. And we just don't have the experience that other people had to work through in their day. So wood to us is a tree, a bench. But we don't even think about how the, the bench was made from a tree. We don't even think about that. But when the Torah speaks about wood or a tree, 
It means something you have to relate to. You have to understand what it means. So, so if God, the sages say, if we were told to chop wood, we would chop wood. So in those days, it had a use. Maybe it's relevant and significant that now we don't really have the same idea of the use, use of wood. And now we have to think about it. So it means utility. So now, since we're removed from the idea of utility with wood, you could maybe appreciate more what I think it really means. On a deeper level, it always mean, resonates on all levels, obviously. But wood, when we think of wood, because every morning we're reading about Avram Avinu going to chop wood. Why was he going to chop wood? Not to heat his house. He lived in the desert. Water is the symbol in the desert of wood as, as it is in, for the Arctic. <laughs> wood is, is heat. It's that. It's a house. So why does God, why would we would you, why would we use that as an example of something that we would even do? Even that. That's the thing of utility. No, but in our era, secrets come out. Secrets are coming out as we go further, closer to the redemptive state called the Geula. Secrets are coming out. So we could appreciate things deeper now sometimes because we're removed from their real meanings. And now it comes out when we don't understand what wood is. Now we, we, I think this idea is going to come out that when we cut wood, it means the wood to offer Yitzchak on an altar. Yitzchak was offered on an altar and that is what distinguishes Jews from the rest of the world. That moment. Because what does it mean that he was going to sacrifice his son on a altar topped with wood to burn, right? What, is, what does it mean? It means that you subscribe to a morality that the entire world knows that this is your unique contribution. Avraham faced a world of total darkness, no morality at all. And he was told to ruin all of that work of your introducing something so profound and important to the entire history of the, of the universe, right? The consciousness, the development of consciousness was established by Avraham. Morality, which is the main thing. Wisdom is something okay. They'll let it come after that. But So Avraham introduces morality to the world. And now he's told to do something that would destroy everything he worked for. To transform consciousness from evil by default, right? We're pretty, we don't have great tendencies by default. So you have to have morality. And Avram introduces that, and then he's told to sacrifice his son, something that he fought against, the idea of human sacrifice. The first time in history someone says, let's, let's think about what we're doing, whether it's good or bad. I mean, there were individuals that did think that way too. But they didn't stand up to the world and try and change the world. But that's what Avram did. So Avram teaches us that wood is not about utility, what we can gain from it. That's one level of understanding what the sages meant. On a superficial level, you're not really trying to understand what they, they're just, as the, the sages are just giving you good advice. No, they're teaching you the secrets of how your mind should work. That's what the Torah is. The Torah teaches you how should your mind work so that you could be in line with the Creator. So the entire universe, or whatever you want to call it. You want to be in line with that? That's the secrets that are taught to us by the sages. So the sages say we would chop wood. We would take those things that have utility to us. And devote them to total faith in God. Oh, this is the next topic I wanted to get to. Faith in God. <laughs> what is the significance and meaning of that? I just learned something very interesting about that, but I think I should probably save that because I'm, not, I'm totally out of time and beyond. And this way I'll remember it. This could be a good notebook <laughs> for my thoughts and where we're going. I have to remember what it was. But it was really nice to host another rant. 
Shalom to everybody in all languages. <laughs> you should also be blessed. I don't know if I scroll up to see if there were comments before. Other languages. Maybe I should try and rem think of about them my next topic and just say it. Oh, I can't remember. <laughs> so I will try and get to that next time. I'm going to really work on it, but if I see this video, I'm sure I'll remember. Bye-bye.